www.oarsthroughucc.org, Plymouth Facebook page, or through YouTube. Either way, we are thankful that we can worship together, whether we are near or far. I am Deacon Beatrice Kelly. Our senior pastor is Reverend Graylin Scott Hagler, and I welcome you on behalf of the ministers, officers, and members of Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. I greet you from the nation's capital, a colony looking to become the 51st state. Welcome. We are advocates for our vaccination, science, and we urge you to take every opportunity to get vaccinated if you have not, and to get the booster if you are eligible. If you are in the sanctuary today, you are required to wear a mask, use sanitizers, and engage in safe practices. If you are not comfortable coming into the sanctuary and church facilities just yet, or if you live in another state, you can continue to join us via the internet. We will continue our programs and learning ministries during the week. You are invited to join us for Bible study on Tuesdays, Wednesdays for our dial-up and power-up prayer call. There is our midweek service on Thursdays, our spiritual grounding sessions on Friday at 12 noon. Join us in one of all of these dynamic sessions. We are located at 5301 North Capitol Street Northeast in Washington, D.C. We are thankful and honored that you are joining with us this morning, physically and through cyberspace. We are a church of deep history, progressivism, and liberation. We have been, community, we have been a community of faith since 1881. Yes, this is our 140th anniversary year. If you have been blessed by these services over these last 18 months or so, and live in the area, then we hope you will bless you will bless us with your presence. If you are not physically here in the sanctuary, let us know of your desire to officially become part of this ministry of Jesus Christ. We hope that you will join us in the work of love, this passion for justice, and this mission for Jesus from this corner into the world. We worship, we praise the Lord, we examine issues in our world. Worship is a time to gain perspective, to refuel and regain strength for the continued work ahead. We continue working towards freedom, justice, and wholeness. We continue to work towards the manifestations of the perfection of God. We look to embody as people of God the mantra of nobody is free until everybody is free. Come, worship, and lift praises, because this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Good morning, Plymouth. Good morning. It is call to worship, and you know many of us, all of us, are called to be husbands, called to be wives, called to be heads of households. We're called to work. We're called to pay taxes. But this morning, we are called to worship as like believers, children of the Most High God. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to be on one accord, that we may do just that. Psalms 29, verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Amen? Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we bless your name. The truth is, there is none like you. Father, you sit high and you look low. Father, you're sovereign, you're omnipresent. You're omnipotent, you're omniscient. Father, you're great, you're mighty, you're strong, you're powerful. You are in a class all by yourself. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are from everlasting to everlasting. Father, you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our victory. Jehovah Shalom, our peace. Jehovah Rapha. I heal you. You are El Elyon, the most high God. El Elam, 
the everlasting God, El Roi, the strong one who sees. Father, you are the rock. You are the cornerstone. You are the bright morning star. You are the Lord of hosts, the Prince of Peace. Father, you are our healer, our deliverer, our way maker. Father, in your presence is where we desire to be. It is where we belong, Father, because we know that in your presence, all is well. All our needs will be met. Nothing can harm us, Father. It might come against us, but it cannot harm us because we are in the presence of the Most High God who loves his children dearly, that he sent his son to die on the cross that we might have eternal life in heaven and be with you forever. Father, your word tells us that we are special, that we are valuable, that you made us in your image, your likeness, that you touched us with your hands. We're the only thing that you touched with your hands when you created the universe. And so, Father, we recognize who you are. And this morning, Father, we ask that your presence will come to this sanctuary, that it would fill this place and fill our hearts, that we might be able to go back into our homes and our communities and spread, spread the gospel, the good news, throughout our families and communities. Father, we bless your holy name. We love you so much because you first loved us. Father, there truly is none like you. There's not a close second. There's not anyone like you, Father. You are just, you're righteous, and Father, you are holy, holy, holy. There is none holier than thou. And Father, we bless your name right now. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. And all the children of God said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, congregation. I want you to turn to page 504. And as we heard in that prayer, everything God needs us to be. Um, this song says, love, look at me. We don't have to say, I love you to people. But what we have to do is to give a smile, a cheery hello, and you don't know sometimes what that will do to a person. You don't know what they've been going through before you showed up and before you said that to them. Yeah. So that is love, yeah. lifting people. So let's join in and sing 504. So could you please stand? <clears throat>
you, but I'm glad about the love. But the psalm writer is right. I was sinking deep in sin, far, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But he came and touched my heart. Did he touch anybody's heart? Okay, y'all, well, y'all, y'all got your, uh, your mask on, so I won't push you too much, but... Did it touch your heart? Yeah. Amen. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and minds now for our pastoral moment, I want to say to the church, thank you so much. Last Sunday was a wonderful, we had a wonderful time. Yeah. Amen. And you know, whenever somebody gives me anything, Amen. I'm extremely appreciative. Amen. And I want to thank you for that piece of artwork. It is beautiful. Anybody who's ever been to my heart know, house knows that I, my walls are filled with art. So I'm taking down a piece just to put up that piece. Amen? Amen. And so I thank you so very much, Plymouth. You are a special people. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else can heal all of our soul diseases. No, not one. No, Jesus knows all about our trouble, y'all. If nobody else knows, Jesus knows all about our trouble. I'm going to ask you to turn to page 308, 308. Page 308. Like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one, none else can heal all our soul diseases. No, not one, no, 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 not one, but Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will God till the day is done. There's not a friend like the Holy Jesus. No, not one. No, 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 not one. On this day, we're in prayer. For there's some folk on our prayer and praise, on our prayer list, that we want to make sure we lift up. Today we're lifting up services for Henry, Henry Ellen Butler. Services will take place on Saturday, November 6th, 
2021 with visitation at 10 and services at 11 here at Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. We pray for Kessler Kemp, who is in the hospital, also for Rhett Lucas, who's also in the hospital. We keep Dolores Tucker in prayer, who is also in the hospital. We pray for Ida Jackson and Al Briggs, Donald Monet and Cal Smith, Joe Johnson, Leroy and Sarah Ellison, Beverly Gilmore, Jacqueline Lukeman, and Geraldine Brown. We pray that God will continue to intervene in all the situations in a loud and healing way. We pray for the two people that called to solicit our prayers. We pray them that what they are going through, we're praying for their situation. We pray for those who are ill, depressed, and for all people feeling the anxiety of the time. We pray, Lord, we pray for the people who are depleted, kneeling, needing to be lifted out of sorrow and despair. Pray for people looking for a positive breakthrough in their lives. We pray for others in all the conditions and the circumstances that they may be in. Pray for the redemption of the nation and that it might rid itself from hatred and the sin of racism and white idolatry. We pray those who are unemployed, laid off, and underemployed. We pray that we might be healed in body, mind, and spirit. Pray work and pray some more, y'all. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this day. For our hearts are filled with gratitude. Yes. That you've allowed us to be a part of this experience of worship. Yes. We have entered into thy gates with thanksgiving. And, and in so we want to just say thank you. Thank you because you've kept us and you sustain us all week long. And that the truth be known, Lord, we've become so accustomed to being sustained that from time to time we forget to say thank you. We've become so used to you doing things and working it out on our behalf that we've gotten lazy. And sometimes we have gotten sidetracked. But today all of us want to just say thank you. We thank you for last night's lying down and our early morning rising. We thank you, Lord, because when we got up, we were able to be clothed and in right mind. And so we say thank you. We thank you that we made it out to the house of worship one more time. And for that, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, because... We are able to lift up our voice and lift up our hands and to stand in the presence of you, Lord. So we say thank you. Lord, we got some folk who are on our sick and shut-in list that are unable to do those things on this day. We want them to know that we are praying on their behalf. We're praying that, Lord, that you will stop by and touch them with a finger of love and let them know that the healing power that is possessed by you can be transferred over to them. Only if they would have had the faith that you are a healer, a deliverer, a lifter of our heads. And for this, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you for the bereaved hearts on the day, Lord, because there are those whose loved ones had transitioned over to the other side. Because of that, Lord, they, there's a moment of sadness. For this, we say thank you for the opportunity to pray for them as well. Lord, we thank you for this church called Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. We thank you because you've allowed us to be here for 140 years, Lord. And we're still here. We're still doing what you called us to do. We're still on this battlefield of justice. We're still Working out our purpose, Lord, for this we say thank you. We thank you for our pastor and his leadership, Lord. We ask that you continue to keep him healthy. Continue to keep him strong. 
Prop them up on every leading side if you pray in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the leadership of this church. We thank you for their dedication to this ministry. We thank you during lean times they continue to hold out. And during time of plenty, they continue to stay put. We thank you for each and every member of this church. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would simply bless them in their comings and in their goings. We thank you for this city. We thank you for what you're doing in this country. And we thank you for this world. Lord, you know our very heart. You know that there are things that look about us that ought not be. Well, the truth be known, we've done some things we had no business doing. We said some things we had no business saying. We thought some thoughts we had no business thinking. And Lord, we've been some places we had no business being. But because of your grace and your mercy, Lord, you continue to revive us over and over and over again. And for that, we say thank you. And Lord, as we come to the end of this prayer, we ask if there's anything that lurks about us that ought not be, that you take it away, Lord. But we want to be like you. We pray this prayer. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's not a friend like the Lord, Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Amen. Amen. Um, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Now, y'all you, had a wonderful time on last Sunday. You clapped. You shouted, you sang, you, you did everything you were big enough to do. Now we're in the house of worship one more time. Yeah. Now I know you got good rest. Yeah, it can't be that tired. I know it's a fifth Sunday, y'all. Some of y'all are used to staying at home in the country. Fifth Sunday was every other Sunday. But uh, how many of you just want to bless that wonderful name of Jesus? Yeah. There you go. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. There's no other name I know. Why don't you bless that wonderful name of Just when I think about the goodness come on, of Jesus, come on, come on. 
when I think about the goodness of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Oh, y'all don't hear me? When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I can't speak for you, but everything he's done for me, my soul cries out what? Hallelujah. My soul cries out hallelujah. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God for saving us. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Reverend Hagler. Good morning. Good morning, Reverend King. Good morning. Good morning, musicians, technicians. Officers, members, and friends, God morning. God morning. And happy, holy ween. Amen. <laughs> Amen. My name is Benita Taylor, and I greet you this morning on behalf of the Greeters Ministry. To those of you who are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary, if you're visiting, would you please stand to be acknowledged? Good morning. Yeah. Happy Holy Week. And also to those of you who are worshiping with us in cyberspace, God morning and happy Holy Week to you as well. I leave you with the thought for today centered around Holy Week. I want you to remember three things. Trick Treat and the Holy Spirit. Don't be tricked into doing ungodly like things. Yeah. Treat your neighbors with respect and kindness. Amen. And allow the Holy Spirit to descend upon you. Amen. 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 Now, as we take this time to pass the peace, we are going to limit movement throughout the sanctuary. So if you would stand in place, greet the ghoul to your left and the ghoul to your right, the ghoul behind you and the ghoul before you. You can greet with a fist bump, an elbow bump, or your hand over your heart in reverence. May the peace of Christ be with you. I'm ready for the word. Amen. I want to greet you this morning in the love and the joy of Jesus. I want all of you who are gathered here and those who are tuning in online, just a reminder that this is the day that the Lord has made. We need to rejoice and be glad in it and give God some praise one more time. For the Lord got us up this morning, started us on our way, and we need to remind ourselves when we come into the house of worship of all of the blessings that the Lord has blessed us with because it's so easy to go through a week and go through life and not pause to give God the praise for all of the blessings that God has blessed you with, the small things as well as the big things. We always recognize the big things, but sometimes we overlook the little things which contribute to the big things. And so, therefore, when we come into the house of worship, 
We give God some praise for all of the times in which we failed to praise the Lord. Praise him one more time. There's only you know what he has done for you. Amen. Amen. We greet you this morning and uh, greet uh, uh, Ernest Hargrove, who was our minister of music so faithfully on that piano. Ernest, good to see you this morning. Let folk know you're here. That's, a, that's an interesting percussion. Amen. A chair drop. And uh, we, we have Brother uh, Isaiah Galloway who's on the drums. And we got Brother Keith who's also on the drums. And Brother Galloway, let us know you're here. Amen. I, I, I lift up that young brother because... He so faithfully comes every single Sunday uh, to uh, be on those drums and to share and contribute in the worship. I'm just so proud of Isaiah uh, for his discipline and his commitment uh, and his love of the church. So God bless you. And uh, I want to thank everybody who has participated so far in the service. Uh, lift up Sister Marion Peel, who keeps uh, keep, keeping us innovative with technology. And Wendy Farmer, who's also over there assisting uh, yeah, yeah. Sister Pia. Yeah. I, I, I want to thank her. <laughs> want to thank her husband, uh, uh, Minister uh, Bruce Farmer, for lifting us up and calling us to worship this morning, and Sister Benita Taylor for blessing us uh, with her greet with the greeting ministry. And want to just thank everybody for being here. Last Sunday <clears throat> was a tremendous time. Our home uh, coming service, and folk came in from all over. Uh, uh, Anita from Florida, for example, and and they filled up this uh, this uh, choir loft and and just sang and and uh, you know some of our not so young young folks were here and uh, had grown up in the church and many of them just came back to bless uh, this church uh, with their with their hearts and their souls. And so I want to just thank all of them and everybody who sang and all of the effort, earnest that you put into organizing it, all of the ways in which Sister uh, Diane Witt helped to call it together and move us forward with it. And I just want to give thanks to Sister Diane Witt for continuing to keep us uh, uh, motivated and for drawing together folks to keep us going forward. <laughs> Diane, thank you so much. God bless you. Amen. We give thanks to God for all the good things. Um, our Bible study, you should join in to that, is on Tuesdays at 12 noon. It uh, goes from 12 to 1. We're studying the book of Amos. Uh, midweek service, we've been in a series that has been uh, lifted up by Minister Garrett Jordan. That's on Thursdays at 6.30. Garrett is on his way back here to... From, to to D.C. from North Carolina, so pray with him that he has a safe journey in his travel. He went to see his mother. And so we join in, in prayer with him as he travels. On Thursday, on, on Fridays, we have our spiritual grounding session that takes place from 12 noon to 1. This week we will have the Reverend Robert Childs, who is the pastor of Berea Baptist Church, as our presenter. Last week we had Reverend Holly uh, Jackson, who is the moderator of the Potomac Association and pastor of Seneca Valley United Church of Christ as our presenter. So join with us in these very, very wonderful sessions. Uh, our dial up and power up prayer call is 6 a.m. on Wednesday mornings. You can join us on that. You can find uh, the numbers listed in your church's e-newsletter. If you do not get the church's e-newsletter, you need to let somebody know so that we can put you on the list. Uh, if you've been bounced off the list, there's another way in which we can get you on the list. So let us know uh, about uh, uh, your desire to get that uh, church's e-newsletter. Um, also, um, I just want us to think about and remember our 140th anniversary as we continue to go through this year and the sacrifices that were made to get here. We're calling on our members and friends to sacrificially give to our mortgage debt. 
you are being asked to make a special 140th anniversary gift to Plymouth of $1,400 before the end of the year. Everyone is in a different place economically, and some can do more, and others can do less. Uh, in fact, this week we got a $2,000 check for the mortgage reduction uh, from somebody who just felt that they could do a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, but if you can do more, even if you have less, by asking your friends and families to help you to contribute to the church through you and help you make that goal of $1,400. That comes to $10 per year for 140 years. That's a pretty good investment. And the reason I raise this also is that as the mortgage comes, you know, in, in any typical kind of commercial loan, uh, every five years there's a balloon payment. And the balloon payment is the opportunity to pay down the principal, right? So if we concentrate on collecting that mortgage money, we can buy down the debt when that balloon payment comes due. So in a sense, your mortgage payment goes down over time if you're disciplined about really paying that down and paying that off so that when it's refinanced, it's refinanced at a lower debt. Uh, and uh, if you do that again the next five years, it's refinanced as a lower debt. And so in a sense, you know, it's a matter of us planning to pay down the debt, how we do it. And so I want us to be faithful to that. Uh, and make that commitment. And I'm going to make my commitment before the end of this year is up. So, uh, Brother Trustee Alan Johnson, we expect to get a gift from me that's going to be debt reduction. Uh, so, uh, so we're just going to do that together, and we can get there together. Let's be, let's be faithful and joyous in how we do it. Also, you know, you can help the church meet its annual budget. Tithing is a good one way to help the church. A tithe helps to guide you in your giving. Generally speaking, the tithe is 10%. Another way to look at the math of meeting our budget is if 200 people gave $79 per week over 52 weeks uh, of the year that would successfully secure the budget, or 150 people averaging at least $105 per week over 52 weeks. There are currently numbers of members and friends of Plymouth who have heeded this message and are already given better than this, and we thank you for your generosity. Some cannot do as much, but the perfection of the community of believers is that everyone can do their genuine part, and God will do the rest. Do your best, and the Lord will bless. And we want to thank everybody for making that kind of commitment to the church. We're thankful for all the faithful members and friends that continue to generously give to the church. It really shows how people want to keep a liberating and progressive interpretation of God's word alive and thriving. We thank all the people who always send in their tithes and contributions through one of the methods that have been made available, and many give even as this appeal is being made. You can give through the church's website, www.plymouth-ucc.org. All the methods are listed on that web page. You can give by cash app. Our cash tag is dollar sign Plymouth DC. You can give through Givelify and find us as Plymouth Congregational Church, Washington, D.C. If you pay your bills through your bank's online bill pay, consider making Plymouth one of those payments. The bank will even pay the postage for you, or you can mail your tithes and contributions to Plymouth UCC, 5301 North Capitol Street, Northeast Washington, D.C., 20011. We thank you for your love of the church for your embrace of the good news of Jesus, and for blessing this manifestation of God's word. An offering plate is here at the front of the church, and those in the sanctuary can make their way down the aisle to place their tithes, offerings, and gifts in the plate after our prayer. Let us join in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Buddy is reminding me, thank God for Buddy reminding me, that on fifth Sunday there's also a second offering. And that second offering is our Benevolence Fund, which is administered by the diaconate. And the Benevolent fund, Benevolence Fund helps to go towards those who have particular need uh, in, in, in the month uh, and uh, need some help. Uh, and so it's a way in which the church can contribute uh, to assist people in their need. And that need has often been a lifesaver, believe me, for people. Uh, and so we give because the Lord 
has given to us. Let us join in prayer. Lord, we just thank you. With our hands and our hearts, our mind and our spirit for all the blessings that you have blessed us with. Lord, you've not withheld one thing, but you have poured everything into our being and into our lives. And so, Lord, we render back now a portion of that which you have blessed us with. We give to the glory of God. We give in a spirit of thankfulness and joy. We give because you first loved us. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture is coming from Mark 28 through 34. When you have it, I'll give you a moment to find that in your Bibles, and I'll read. I've been told to slow down and give you a moment. Amen. And obedience is better than sacrifice. You still, okay, uh, it wants me to speak up, okay? Mark 28 through 34. Mark, I'm sorry. Mark 12. 
28 through 34. And when you have it, say amen. 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 Question of the greatest commandment. Then one of the scribes came, having heard from them, reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. This is the word of God for the people of God. May the word go forth. Amen. Amen. As we prepare, excuse me for the pastor to come and bring forth the word of life. I want to remind us about one thing, just where we fit in the grand scheme of things, amen? <clears throat> and so, only what you do for Christ will last. You may build great cathedrals large and small you can build skyscrapers grand or tall you may conquer all the failures of your past but only what you do for Christ will last powers and fame the world might be impressed by your great name soon the glories of this life will pass but only what you do for Christ will last remember only what you do for Christ will last remember only what you do for Christ will last only what you do for him will be counted in 
Kenneth King powerfully allows himself to be used by God and share that gift that he got with all of us and we just give thanks for him. If you would join with me in a moment of prayer, Lord, we come to you and we just give you thanks today for this word, this challenge of this word. And we ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our beings so that we may perceive and receive what it is that you're saying to us in these moments in which we stand, these hours in which we live. For one thing is certain, Lord, that is that you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are fitted for your kingdom. And Lord, uh, we ask that you just open our hearts and spirit in this teaching time, that you hone the message, you shape it, you send it forth as you see fit, allow it to be filled with learning so that we may learn and grow uh, because of your word, because of you. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to hold up uh, Florence McDaniels in your prayers. I just got a message just now. Uh, that she's in Holy Cross Hospital, so hold her in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I did have an opportunity to uh, have an electronic visit with uh, Brother Kemp uh, this past week and also saw Sister Dolores Tucker in the hospital this week, and I also saw Brett Lucas in the hospital this week. So hold them in your prayers and your thoughts, uh, and uh, we just continue to surround them with our spirit. Now, I'm going to ask uh, if folks uh, want to have a little conversation at the church this morning uh, to come and be in the center aisle so that we can have some discussion because you might be a little troubled or upset about what I'm going to deliver this morning or you might need a little clarity around it. Uh, and uh, as I wrestle with that word, because you know that in this role, it's not only to be uh, someone that helps to inspire, but it's also to be someone that helps teach help to break open uh, the, the scripture for us and I'm one that never uh, choose to leave my mind at the door but to bring it in with me when I lift and I try to impart some knowledge or at least some uh, uh, create some questions that you may have and that's a part of teaching. I'm going to speak a little bit on the subject evolving faith or what we know now Revolving faith or what we know now. Now, I often think about the evolution of our faith, spirituality and thought and belief. These things hopefully are not static, but grows and evolves as we do. I have a problem with the adage of literalism that says, God said it, I believe it, that's it. This means that we fail in exploring the depths of our faith and spirituality. We refuse to encounter the text freshly, contemporarily understand it, and make it relevant to our times. If we are truthful with ourselves, our sense of faith, the depth of spirituality springs from what we learned when we were younger, but has evolved hopefully to meet the challenges and complexities of living. We do not think about things the way we thought about things when we were children, unless we are arrested in our development and growth. Our understanding or viewpoint should be evolving and growing and is not what it was when we were children. First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 reminds the reader, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Our experiences, our life encounters, our heartbreaks, our disappointments, our ups and downs, our celebrations and joys change us. Some things test us at the core of our beliefs. And what was known yesterday is created as a new reality in the present and into the future. Sometimes we are stressed and tested, molded by the occurrences in life. What we knew at some younger stage of existence is no longer valid today, but is nuanced by life. And there are revelations breaking open and forth that we have not considered before. 
Our beliefs, spirituality, faith, and perspectives change and grow by the experiences we have in life. Our understanding of God has changed, I hope. This is the evolution of who we are. And not so much the evolution of God, but it's an evolution of who we are, that we relate to God differently as we move through life and have encountered life and the experiences of life and the struggles struggles around life, sometimes the disappointments and the joy. We relate to God differently. But our minds, if you think about it, have been trained and fixated on a God in the clouds, hurling thunderbolts towards earth, wiping out people in villages, and whose disposition seems to be harsh and without mercy. I remember always hearing people, and I know you heard people saying, talk about the man upstairs, yes. right? Uh, as, as a euphemism for God, right? Uh, uh, but what about God being in your midst? If you look at the scripture, what does Jesus say and said, you're not very far from the kingdom, or God is in our midst. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Your faith has made you what? Your faith has changed you, has changed your interaction and your relationship with God. Jesus' understanding of God challenges all of that viewpoint that we brought with us from some place. Jesus presents a kinder and more loving God than the God of our youth or the God of the Old Testament. In the old religious traditions, there were goat offerings and calf offerings and bull offerings and there were sacrifices of blood. We don't do that anymore, thank God. Something has changed. Our beliefs, our faith, our customs, and even rituals have evolved, and it appears we know something more today than we knew before. For example, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 18, speaks in these terms. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near, one who is blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a blemish in his eyes or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the food to his God. And the list of do's and don'ts continue and it's difficult to remember and to know them all. The old religious perspective understood disabilities to be a curse, a manifestation of sins, and unable, therefore, to stand in the presence of God. Thank God we have changed, evolved, and grown. We don't see things as we saw them yesterday. Of course, these dictates were created by men, and it comes from their limited definition of the holy and the profane and what is sacred and what is not. As we continue to explore the scriptures in our Bible study, we have seen where the original writings of one book or another endured the addition of text, and in some cases, the deletion of text. Some people argue that the Bible, therefore, cannot be the word of God because it has been tampered with. You hear people say that all the time. Well, that, in my opinion, is a very shallow and superficial argument. Another way to look at additions and deletions of the text is that the subsequent scribes were wrestling with and engaged in a sacred and a holy interaction with the scripture, even as they were copying scripture from one parchment to another. You see, you see, you don't engage in copying scripture without a heart filled with the love of God. You don't copy scripture unless you are engaged in a communion with God. All you got to do is look at old scrolls to realize the artistry that went into them was not simply because somebody was an artist, but because somebody was communing with the holy and divine one. And so... In that, you have living prayer. 
In that, you have involved in religious theological perspective. In that, you have somebody saying that God is alive and God is speaking to me right now in the copying even of this text. Y'all with me so far? Now remember, the printing press becomes something that revolutionized writing into mass production. The German goldsmith Johannes Gutenberg is credited with inventing the printing press about 1436. However, woodblock printing in China dates back to the 9th century. And Korean, Korean bookmaking were printing with movable metal type a century before Gutenberg. But on any account, the printing press revolutionizes the reproduction of books and pictures. Yet it also freezes the text, lessening human interaction in the transcribing of writings and particularly scripture. In other words, it fixes what was a living tradition. It fixes in place what was a tradition that continued to evolve and to grow. When you go to Isaiah, for example, you know, one thing you gotta look at, are you talking about Isaiah one, or are you talking about Isaiah two, or are you talking about Isaiah three? You say, well, where is one and two and three? Well, it is because that book spans such a long amount, a great amount of time, that we know it's not one author, and also the literary style of the book changes that we know is not one author, but it is a series of authors that continue to commune with God as they expand this book. It does not lessen the veracity of the book. It does not lessen the truthfulness of the book, but it makes it more poignant and makes it more powerful because that means that God is speaking to us through the eons and the ages, and God is speaking to us through the struggles of life, and God is speaking to the heart of women and men. So, 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 the printing press freezes it in place. It eliminates an interaction with the text that demonstrates the evolution and development of scripture where human beings read and copied text and asked themselves, what is God saying now? Or what would God say in this historical and particular moment? The scriptures was a living and evolving organism as the word was read in one book or scroll and was copied by the artistry of a scribe onto a new parchment of a new scroll. God has spoken and was still speaking every time text was copied and sometimes changed to reflect the dynamics of a particular moment or circumstance or the prayer of a scribe to God for clarity and enlightenment. Our understanding of God And our faithful and spiritual posture all say always change, and rightly so, whether we want to admit it or not. For example, the text before us in the Gospel of Mark is drawn from the Deuteronomic text in chapter 6, verse 4, that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Yet when Jesus is asked by the scribe to cite the first of the commandments, he cites this text from Deuteronomy 6. You know, very often they say, well, what is the great? Well, the real translation is what is the first commandment? Just like you read uh, Minister Farmer. What is the first commandment? Not necessarily what is the greatest commandment, but what is the first? Read the text closely and understand that it's talking about what is the first of the commandments and he cites the text from Deuteronomy 6. And these words are one of the most important prayers in Judaism. It is like the Lord's Prayer. It is called the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That is the central prayer that simply says, Hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, 
The Lord is our God. The Lord is one, or the Lord is alone. Yet, these words are not the words of the first commandment. As it is written in Exodus 20, chapter 2, where it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. How does this fit in with the proclamation of Deuteronomy 6? And how does it fit in with the statement around the first commandment? The concept, the words, and the thoughts are evolving, you see. The book of Deuteronomy is saying, I know something more than I knew in the wilderness, and when I was a child, I thought like what? Then Jesus takes the Shema, or the words of Deuteronomy 6, and it is still evolving. And so he says in the good news of Mark, The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Notice that in Jesus' rendering of the teaching. He adds some words claiming that there is a second commandment or that there is a subset to the first commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This does not exist in the Deuteronomy text. The thought around the subject is evolving from what is written and what is restated and what is rewritten now. In Amos, as we study the book of Amos and Bible study, we hear the cadence, for example, of Amos chapter 5, verse 21 to 24, that says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offering and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Amos, like Jesus, is taking ideas of old and updating them. Worship for Amos is doing justice. Treating the poor right. Treating people right. In other words, loving your neighbor. Whereas the first commandment that calls for the recognition and the reverence of God extends to neighbor according to Jesus. Our understanding of what scripture means evolves and grows, becoming more meaningful to life as the world changes and evolves around us. Now you hear people asking, Every Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, as they look at the news, they would say, well, what would Martin Luther King be saying? Likewise, we should be asking, what is God and what is Jesus saying in this historical moment? What is God and what is Jesus saying to racism? And what is God and Jesus saying to white idolatry? What is God and Jesus saying to climate change or to heterosexism or capitalism or unemployment or underemployment or state-sanctioned murder? What would God and Jesus be saying to interpret these things in the light of our faith is to encounter an evolving and relevant faith. You know, many people write God off because of what they heard in their childhood and did not allow their childlike beliefs to change and to grow. People are still angry at an angry God. People are still estranged from a God that they believe is estranged from them and hate them. People cannot come to God because of unforgivable sins that they feel that they carry in their lives. But we find out through Jesus and his revolutionary and evolutionary teachings that God is love. And to love God means we must love our neighbor. 
And in order to love your neighbor, you got to learn how to love yourself. Jesus came to teach us that our own fears, our estrangement, the distance we keep from the Lord, and the anger that we have with God needs to evolve and grow and become unstuck. God loves you. And Jesus loves you so much that he died defending his love. People wanted to know that if Jesus was so holy, how could he heal on the Sabbath? It was against the law. And he showed the world these were the ways of man. But the way of God is love and blessings and healing, even if it is on a Sabbath. The faith and belief were evolving. And Jesus taught people about the goodness of God. He taught them about the story of the good Samaritan. And you got to remember, Samaritans were hated. Samaritans were considered unclean. Samaritans were folks that were looked down upon by everybody else. Samaritans were folks that could contaminate everybody if you came into contact with them. Doesn't that sound a little bit about America's Jim Crow? Doesn't that sound like the kind of xenophobia and racism that exists not only in this country but worldwide? And Jesus keeps taunting them by telling them a story about a good Samaritan. What do you mean a good Samaritan? There's no good Samaritan around here. Jesus tells a story about ten folk that got healed from leprosy and the only one that came back to thank Jesus was what? A Samaritan. And Jesus reveals himself to the woman at the well who was what? A Samaritan. His faith, his understanding of God was evolving and changing and he was showing us to get unstuck. To come to a place where you realize that God is still speaking. God still has something to say in these contemporary times. God is speaking right now. Whether you want to hear it or not, that's up to you. But God is speaking about our brokenness and God is speaking about our fractured and polarized world and country. God is speaking in the midst of all of the noise that we hear around us. God is even speaking on the internet. And God is speaking every day to us about what God would do. How God wants to reach you and touch you and lift you out of your places of being stuck and remind you that God is truly a loving God. You see, in this moment, in this current moment, in these new moments, we need some good news. And God is still speaking good news. God's word is fresh and real and relevant for the day, for our day, and for our lives. Jesus reminds us that God will meet you in your circumstance. God will meet you in your situation. God will meet you in your struggles and hopes because God is alive. And so is God's word. Now as the church declared years ago, the United Church of Christ, that God is still speaking, which was a way to declare that God is still, and God's word is still for every moment, for every situation, for every circumstance, for every person, and for every life. When we allow the events of life to flow through us and to wash over us, then we know that God has a word. God has a plan. And God has some direction in our lives. And God is calling us to a new place to stand and receive the goodness of God. You see, I I, I personally know that that God is moving and acting and speaking when you got cancer. I know that. God is speaking and moving and acting when you've been beaten down. I know that. I know that God not only 
spoke a century ago or a millennium ago, but God is speaking right now in 2021. God is reminding us that we are his child. God is reminding us that we are his, his, the ones he loves. God is reminding us that healing and blessing and strength is something that he provides in this moment in your need no matter what the world has to say God is speaking louder than the world can ever speak we understand through Jesus think about the evolution of the faith we understand through Jesus that God is not an angry God but God is a loving God we realize that God's evolving word speaks to our evolving and changing life with compassion, with healing, and with hope. God is a loving God that one day our God packed his bag and went out on a journey and he stepped off of that cliff that called heaven and came down to earth and walked among us to show us what the love of God was all about. To touch somebody who thought that they were a sinner. To heal somebody who thought they had given up. Walked among us, got his feet all dirty and his brow all sweaty. Walked among us and taught us that God is love and God is available to you right here, right now, this day. Somebody needs God in their life. Somebody needs to have the Lord. Somebody needs to be uplifted today. Somebody needs to be blessed today. Somebody needs to say, here I am, Lord. Send me, touch me, love me, bless me. Fill me with your Holy Ghost power. God is speaking. Right now, today, God is touching somebody. I pray somebody heard a message today that understand about the still speaking, still loving, still acting, still moving God. I pray that somebody here today understand that we have a living word. A word that's not fixed. But we have a guide in the scripture that has been written. But God is speaking beyond those pages. God is speaking to our reality. To our heart. To our soul. And is asking us to just engage in this intimate walk with our God. You might learn something along the way. You might grow in a way that you did not expect to grow. You might be healed when you thought you never could be healed. You might be touched in the place that you think is dead. You might be enlivened and lifted up to again to give yourself to God. If you, you, and you, anybody at home, if you know that you need to have this refreshing and renewing God in your life, if you know that you need to have the Spirit to wash over you in your living, then I want to invite you forward to come and give yourself to Jesus. Come and become a part of the Church of Jesus Christ. I pray to somebody here today, if you're at home, if you understand what we're talking about, and you want to give yourself to the Lord, let me know and type in the chat. Somebody will be looking at the chat. We're going to look at who you are and what you're saying. We invite you to become part of this ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I feel I can go a little further. Amen. That was a word today. Come on, give the Lord a hand, praise. I tell people in all of my circles that I don't know a better preacher. I mean, I don't know a better preacher than Reverend Graham Hagler. I don't know one who can break it down. He's a preacher among preachers. Amen. And I'm so glad. Y'all don't know how my heart burns to be a part of the Plymouth Congregation of the United Church of Christ and, and have him preach to me every Sunday. I count it a joy. I really do. And I don't know. You don't have to. I got, I got my own story to tell. I'm excited about that message today. I need to hear it more than ever. Amen. Amen, y'all. Come on, give the Lord another hand. Praise God. You know, and, you know sometimes you just got to call it what it is. Amen. Amen. And so as we go out, I go out knowing that we're going to meet again. Amen. Our hearts will come together again in this place called Plymouth. United Church of Christ. Until we meet. Until.